What's up, YouTube? We have a lot to get to on this week's episode. Realignment, a lot of recruiting news, and some VIP questions answered. But before we get going, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell so that you're notified whenever there is a new video. So let's get going. Happy Wednesday, everyone. I'm Jack Franchuli for Wahoo's 24-7 here with a new episode of the Good Old Podcast. And, you know, it's been a crazy few days for Virginia Athletics. A lot of stuff going around with recruiting and obviously some big news on the realignment front. So we're going to talk about all that on this week's episode. And we're going to do something a bit different where although I would be speaking about the realignment expansion and the scenarios out there, I'm going to welcome in one of our reporters that also covers another ACC team because we've been touching base with each other about stuff that we've heard and just with our opinions um, because this is not something that's settled. Things are still changing every day. So why don't we have some conversation and a little bit of a debate between us about what we think is going to happen and what we see happening. So I'm going to invite our Wake Forest recruiting reporter, Cam Lemons. Cam and I have been talking a lot since UVA and Wake Forest seems to have a lot of uh, a lot of guys they're recruiting at the same time. So, so Cam, I, you know, when we talk about ACC and realignment, there's a lot of different situation scenarios going around. One of the things that's going around right now is obviously the alliance is gone. I mean, who thought a gentleman in handshake <laughs> was a good idea? But with Big Ten's announcement that they poached two Pac-12 schools to join them in UCLA and USC. That alliance is no longer an alliance, but it looks like two of those members are trying to strike a deal. What's your reaction when you see the Pac-12 and the ACC kind of trying to uh, work together here and coming to a loose agreement? It's weird. Um, it's never an easy thing to try to sell to people. Hey, what if we start playing eight games a year across the country? <laughs> Pac-12 um, after night. Yeah, I mean, Pac-12 after dark is one of my favorite things. I'm sicko when it comes to watching college football, but... <laughs> Man, I don't know if you can sell me on a conference game between well, between Wow Duke and Oregon State. I don't know if you can sell me on that one. Um, oh, so you so you mean you don't you're not excited to travel to Washington or I, to you know to I, Oregon? I, I, I spent some time in Seattle, so Seattle's fine. But and I think I, I mean I obviously feel the same way about USC and Rutgers the same way. I think as the whole from like the fan from a fan perspective, it's really, really hard to sit there and try to care about someone across the country from you. Like it's really it, college football has been this regionalized sport and it's really easy to not like the person that's next door to you. It's a lot less, lot less easy to not like the guy across the country from you. Um, I mean, as a whole, from a business perspective, it makes sense. I know I've seen some articles out there that's been like, well, like this is, the Alliance part two and like what's going on here. And I'm just like, you got to do something. You, you can't, you can't sit there and do nothing. There's no moves left that even with Notre Dame, if they get in now 2025 and their deals up, that doesn't move the needle enough like a USC or UCLA moving does. And so I'm fine with it as long as it's, it's built the correct way. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's, that's the big thing too is I, I, well, this is obviously one thing that we've noticed. It looks like it's going to be a signed negotiation, not, you know, a gentleman's hank, wank, wank, wank. So that'll be, that'll be an improvement for the <laughs> ACC and Pac-12. But right now, I think the ACC is in the position that if they don't do something now, it's going to get worse for them. They can't be, they, it's basically you're trying to out survive the Big 12. That, right. that, that's the big thing. You, you don't want to be in the Big 12 position where you're going to be the last one in the, the, the tier. You don't want to be behind right. the Big 12. But no, I mean, I, I agree. Like you're right now, you're not really fighting against the SEC and Big and Big Ten. I think that's the misconception a lot of people have is you're fighting against them to get there, to get up to what they have. What you're trying to fight for right now is honestly survival. You're trying to figure out, okay, how do I solidify myself as that number three spot? And while that can be sometimes viewed as maybe a loser mentality, at the end of the day, this is about survival, and you're trying to keep as men, trying to keep all your members in there, trying to keep everyone happy. And like I said, with the regionality, you're really trying to make sure that everyone still has a home that's in Division One fighting for a playoff, and not you don't want to be in the position the Pac-12 in is right now when they're struggling to find a media deal, they're struggling to find a home. People are trying to pick them off left and right. 
So I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of scenarios. You know, I was just reading another report. Again, this is, there's a lot of reports out there, a lot of different scenarios out there. Only a select few people around the country know exactly what's going on. I think that's something that we need to focus on, too. Not a lot of people know exactly everything that's going on. It's kind of like a coaching search, but even a smaller amount of people yeah. that know from a, from a coaching search. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some people that are talking about a potential UVA, Duke, and UNC alliance within the ACC trying to make sure wherever they jump to, those are the three schools that are working together. Um, but then I've also heard other, other kind of, kind of people talking that are saying other schools kind of mentioned, what do you think is the best case scenario for the ACC? I think the best case scenario is you go through with whatever this partnership is with the with the Pac-12. I think that can bring a lot of value. I mean, Oregon and Washington are two big brands. You can Utah's a big brand. Colorado's a bigger brand than people really want to give it credit for. I think you can solidify yourself getting more getting more money from there. And then when 2025 comes around, you you, you go up to ESPN and say, make Notre Dame the Godfather deal. I think that's the biggest thing you can do right now. Um, you want to make sure you have all access to the playoff considered. You want to make sure that you have the ACC as one of the options on the table for that. And I think giving yourself as much stability as possible in order to continue on without constantly worrying about looking over your shoulder, oh, can the Big Ten poach this? Can the SEC poach this? You know, if you establish yourself, I think that's the best case scenario of getting a, a bunch of teams in from the, from the Pac-10 in is a relative term, but getting them in and then going to Notre Dame in 2025 when their NBC, NBC deal is up and saying, hey, let's get you guys into the ACC, into the ESPN fold and go from there. Yeah, that 2025 year. And I think a lot of it, I know it, it seems a lot urgent right now with everything kind of going on. You think everything is so urgent right now. But 2025 is going to be a big year because not only is that's when Notre Dame's TV negotiations will start and their contract ends right now with NBC, but also – that's the contract for the college football playoffs as well. So technically, if something were to happen and you have something going on with the ACC and, and Pac-12 kind of going together, I don't know what they're going to be named. You know, like the, I, I was the, trying to figure Pac-12. out. Pac-12. Yeah, the, the Pacific Atlantic Coast Conference. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what your name would be. Um, but if you have that alliance and you have this new Big Ten and you need this ACC, you can theoretically have two playoffs going on with this Pac-12 ACC with these of the SEC and Big Ten having their own playoffs. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be sorted within the next two or three years. And even if it doesn't get sorted, we might have a situation where we might have two national champions because no one could get into this deal. So it's there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening within the next two years. And I think the ACC is being more proactive than I thought they would be. But again, whatever they do now, it's basically a stepping stone or a, a band-aid approach until something else happens. So basically it's trying to help these programs for the short term is, is yeah. pretty much what it is. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, there's, there's not really much long-term you're going to be able to do at a certain point, the people calling the shots aren't the ACC. They aren't the SEC. They aren't the big 10. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of I know people keep being like, Oh yeah. Like ESPN and Fox are the people Behind the, behind the scenes being the puppet masters. Yeah, they're the ones signing these multi-billion dollar contracts. They're always going to be ones there. And, and so, also Apple. <laughs> Apple is also negotiating with the Big Ten now. Yeah, Apple, Apple is jumping in. So they, you have all these media partners, and it, it, it's to the point that I don't think for good or for bad, mostly for bad, the conferences aren't in control as much as we think they are. And I think there's a lot of undue pressure on, on a guy like uh, George Godkoff in the Pac-12 and Jim Phillips in the ACC when it's like there's only so much these commissioners can really do when in reality they're not really the ones calling the shots and they know essentially what's good for them this year and next year you know when we get those documents coming out like we just got when we got the one for the ACC revenue for the COVID year and we saw oh wow like the ACC jumped in revenue for once you know they know that ahead of time they've known this for two years we're finding out about these numbers two years later and so right. We're trying to fit. We're we're the ones really playing catch up while they're like we know the situation is going on and we're trying to do everything we can stop it, but we're not the ones in control. Right, and and also you know, you do have that grant of rights agreement 
for, <laughs> for ACC. That kind of ties a few schools down now. There's, you know, there's a lot of people in trying to figure out how you have loopholes in that. I'm guessing if everyone in the ACC decides to leave, I'm guessing, you know, that that would be yeah. a big loophole. Um, but then again, you have to get everyone on the same page. And as we know, that's really hard to do in anything in life and probably in college <laughs> football too. Now, the, the other thing is, I think you, you kind of touched on it. It's not a lot of it's going to be up to university presidents and yeah. athletic directors. And I think mostly it's going to be university presidents, too, because yep. those are the people that will promote your program. You know, if, a, you know, in UVA and Wake's case, both of them are going to promote their academics and yep. what whatever their research they're doing in the school side of things. And I think that's what people forget is not just the sports aspect of it is what this university can bring to this group, you know, Big Ten is all about the AAU certification. That's something that, you know, that could be something that the Big Ten saying, like, we want UVA because of that. Yeah. Um, and also the other sports. I think this is where UVA will have, you know, some luck getting into a conference or being a, a really good option for the Big Ten or even the SEC. I know people think, well, the SEC. But I think actually the SEC might want a UVA there to expand their academic profile. The SEC, the SEC has their own idea that they want to be superior anyways. And what so better that's what I'm is, saying. So what, you bring what better in, is it being superior if you're beating people in every other sport? You're beating people in, in men's and women's tennis. You're beating people in basketball. You're beating people so you bring, in that, That's why I think like a lot of people focus with UVA and Big Ten. And I could see that. And I, I, I can see that a lot, actually. It just it makes perfect sense to bring UVA into the Big Ten. But then you might lose baseball. Um, and then the SEC, you have, you know, baseball champions in the SEC. You, there is, you know, obviously other sports. They don't have men's soccer teams in SEC, but there's a way where you can go in the independent route or join another conference for those particular sports. Kentucky men's soccer does that. So there is options for the other sports. But if the SEC wants to be a winner in every sports, which is what the SEC does try to use their slogan, UVA would fit into those because right. UVA – the, it's, the other sports are what's going to get UVA in the door. You know, men's basketball, um, if women's basketball can turn around, obviously women's and men's soccer is big. Women's soccer, you know, their coach is connected to the national team. Right. Um, you go down the list, baseball, lacrosse, all these people, all these groups have won national titles. You've got Olympians on the swim team. All this is what's going to drive UVA as a prime candidate for going to one of these conferences. And this is where the university and the AD promote your program. That's going to be the key. Can these, can Carla Williams and um, Phillips really promote UVA? And that would be the biggest challenge is going in there and be like, you're getting the DC market, you're getting them this. And that's the same thing with Wake. They're the ones who are going to be there. And then they, this is the reason why Wake should be there. Uh, and I, I think a, a big thing that I'm looking for when it comes out is this is about the time we get the ACC board of directors. Um, I don't think we've gotten that just yet. No. And I think it's going to be a bit telling of what direction the ACC goes in and who's on that committee. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I know Clemson was on there last year, uh, Syracuse, UVA, NC state were on the executive committee. Um, I'm pretty sure wake will be on the executive committee this year. Uh, from what I've heard. And so, you know, I think UVA Wake's, will be also. Yeah. And so, you know, if they're joined with a Clemson or a UNC or an FSU, you know, is it what do the numbers look like in terms of people just trying to do things before they leave or people trying to do things before or to strengthen the ACC? Because I think those are two different ideas. I think I think a lot of the teams in the ACC right now are there. Everyone's trying to sell themselves, whether it's to the ACC, whether it's to the Big Ten, whether it's to the SEC or whether it's to ESPN in general, everyone's trying to sell themselves. And it's just a matter of what group of people is they are there and what direction are they going to go into? Because what Wake wants isn't what Clemson wants and what UVA wants isn't necessarily what FSU wants. And so I think that's going to be an important thing to look out for. So it's like we're covering recruiting in a different <laughs> way. Not again. <laughs> <laughs> if uh if you guys don't follow wake forest uh cam covers the, the recruiting over at wake forest so that's how i cam and i talk a lot because there's obviously a lot of you know recruits that are choosing between uh uva and wake so um yeah it's it's gonna be interesting we're gonna see which ones are i guess good recruiters who are who is selling their program the best <laughs> 
So, well, Cam, thanks uh, so much for joining us and helping us just talk things out. I think that's the, yeah. the biggest thing right now is we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Again, a lot of these deals were in play for a long time and it just come out now. So to say that this is going to happen really quickly is uh, probably not correct. So, um, yeah, so we'll probably see a Wake Forest a little bit more coming up with uh, no coastal and Atlantic. So we'll see That'll you soon. Be great. I'm happy, <laughs> happy to be back. <laughs> And thanks again for Cam for for joining us. Obviously, the big talk about realignment is a is a very complicated subject. Um, so let's talk a little bit about UVA before we kind of move on to recruiting. Big thing with UVA, and I've heard this from talking to a few people, is that Carla Williams is active on this, and that she is is she is being proactive. She's not waiting in the wings either. We have have heard that she has been in communication with a few people, not only in the ACC, but other conferences as well, about how this is going to all play out. So she isn't waiting in the wing. So that's a big thing. And touching on something that I talk to Cam about, I think a lot of people are connecting UVA to the Big Ten, which I completely understand with the idea of marrying UVA to a conference that has uh, some good academic standing, obviously with UVA's research capabilities, you can tie the with the research of several other programs in that conference. But I kind of agree with some people saying that they see UVA fit in the SEC because uh, I don't I know when I say culture fit, it's going to rub people the wrong way. And I'm not saying culture fit as in how things are done in certain areas. But after covering the SEC, I, I do understand how some things culturally UVA can fit in with that conference a little bit more to the Big Ten. And hear me out. The SEC wants to promote the idea, and Cam touched on this too, of being the best conference across different sports, which is why a UVA and a UNC are both programs that they would really like in their conference. UNC and UVA obviously have good basketball traditions. And also, I think UVA brings Olympians in their swimming. Uh, in swimming. They bring... Um, national champions in tennis. They bring national champions in several sports, including men's lacrosse. And you've got men's and women's soccer. I know SEC does not have men's soccer right now, but Kentucky has a men's soccer team and they're able to still continue. SEC does have some good women's soccer programs. I covered one of them at Florida. I think, you know, and then you also have the possibility of adding gymnastics if you're a UVA, which is a sport that is huge. I mean, huge to cover for on the women's females perspective. Um, that could be something that they could venture into as well. Obviously, you got to figure out everything that goes into that with Title IX and, um, distribution of you know male and women's sports. But that's besides the point. I'm just saying that this there's a lot of good things to look on that side of the ball. I think UVA is an excellent team, and I touch on this with Cam too. UVA is is a good primed candidate for one of these conferences due to location and bringing in that entire athletic department. I think a lot of people are focusing too much on football and ignoring the big athletic department and what the whole athletic department can bring to a conference. So obviously it's not going to be settled overnight. So we're going to keep an eye on that. And obviously we're going to keep talking to people about this. No, we just brought on Cam this week because me and him have been going back and forth and messaging with each other about all these rumors and all that stuff. But we're hoping to get a few experts on this who have sources within those communities that can help out and break things down a little bit more. So we'll have something on that in the coming weeks, because again, this is not going to be settled overnight. So we're hoping to get some experts on the topic on the podcast and also on Wahoo's 24 seven. But when we come back, we will be touching on the big recruiting wins across Virginia athletics, because it wasn't just football that I was celebrating this weekend. Plus I answer some of your VIP subscriber questions. Welcome back to the Good Old Podcast. I'm Jack French really for Wahoo's 24-7. It's been a busy few days for the Virginia program, not just with football. Obviously, we all know they got a big win in Cameron Robinson. He chose Virginia over in-state rival Virginia Tech. He committed to the program last week, but football wasn't the only one to land a commitment. Women's basketball coach Mox is killing it on the trail. And the their biggest recruit to date, as far as this class, is Olivia McGee. She's a Louisa County playmaker who decided to stay home for college. Um, she's going to be playing her last high school year at IMG. But the big thing here is that she chose to commit to Coach Mox after an official visit to Kentucky and Virginia Tech and Virginia. She still chose to commit to UVA. It's a huge get for Coach Mox. And obviously, men's basketball 
also with a big get in Blake Buchanan, a top 150 center, deciding to pick Virginia over Gonzaga. And let's take a look at some of these commitments. The big one, obviously, for football is Cameron Robinson. And if you're on YouTube, um, I'm playing his huddle highlights right now. And he's a very, very good get for Virginia. I think this was really important for them because they wanted to kind of focus in on the in-state recruiting and they want to show, hey, we're recruiting in-state. Yes, you're getting in-state commitments and they've gotten quite a few in this cycle, but this was their, you know, uh, I can argue that although Miles Green chose UVA over Virginia Tech um, before, <clears throat> and that was a, you know, Virginia Tech was one of the options there for him. This was a true head-to-head. -head. This was UVA's really big true head-to-head -head after losing another head-to-head -head in Caleb Woodson. And to be fair, I think Wake Forest was possibly the second choice there. So I think this was a big win for Virginia. They beat Virginia Tech after he took an official visit to Virginia Tech. This was a must win for Virginia. Um, they needed some, some sort of momentum in state, and this was a big one for them. And this is a very good player. Cameron Robinson does not get the respect in his name that he deserves because he's a player that has so many things going on. He decided to not to camp because he was focused on baseball. And he's a violent player, very, very physical. He's got, he's got great hands, is able to shed blockers. He tackles very well. And he also has the speed to go after ball carriers. So he's he's a guy that can make you plenty of tackles in the, in the backfield. And he's a big playmaker for them. So I think this was a huge get. I can't under, you can't really underestimate that. Huge win for the Virginia staff. And honestly, Tony Bennett does a great job if we're moving over to basketball. Tony Bennett does a good job evaluating players. He was one of the first on Blake Buchanan before other teams started to noticing them like UCLA and Gonzaga. Gonzaga recently offered. And he, you know, he runs the floor very well. He battles on the glass. He can score from 10 feet. And he shows a, a lot of potential to develop into that big man who can pop up and possibly score a three-point in college, in three-point range in college. So this is another big win on another sport in men's basketball. And I've already touched on women's basketball. I think Coach Mox has done an excellent job trying to hype up the program. You see her on social media. So she's very, very active. She knows that UVA fans wanted a more successful women's basketball program. They've been craving something. So when you have that ability, um, you try to, to try to evoke some excitement by showing what they're doing. When you want to bring up excitement to a program, you have to show the fans, this is what we're trying to do. This is what happens when you support a program. So her being accessible to the media and also her showing herself in personality and then also, you know, showing herself, hey, I'm out recruiting. I'm going out to the live period. I'm going to, you know, I believe they're going to Idaho today. That that is also a, a very big thing. So that was this is a very good um, win for Virginia, keeping another in-state playmaker home. Obviously, they kept Sam Brunel back home after she transferred from Notre Dame. Another big win. So now you're looking at it. You're looking at the counties that are going to be represented in the JPJ and just think of the amount of support and amount of crowds are going to come from those respective counties. Um, so this is a good win for Coach Mox. And, you know, I mentioned on our Wahoos 24-7 board that I wanted some of your questions so that we can kind of focus in on this recruiting conversation a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to answer some of these. Obviously, I won't answer all of them because some of them takes a few days to get some answers. But I promise you that we are actually going to have uh, Brian Doan on the podcast next week. And I'm also trying to get Eric Bossy also to a podcast so we can talk about basketball recruiting as well in the near future. So, again, my plan is to get more basketball content up here as well. I know it's been a lot of football recently, but football was kind of it's a first year head coach. So we wanted to pump up as much uh, football content early on. But. Uh, one of the first questions here for Go Who's is how many more commitments could we take knowing this will be a small class? I think there's probably more five or six commitments. Right now, Virginia has 10 commitments on the board, and they can see Virginia adding up to five or six players to that. Um, kind of give or take, you know, obviously the transfer portal will change that. There might be a ebb or flow of more commits there, but that's certainly a number that I think they're going off. Um Let's see. The next one is who are some potential flip candidates for us still? And who would you say is not rock solid to us in the class? Um, I think potential flip candidates, you know, you, you always, kids are always going to be pretty solidly committed to programs in the first few weeks. I think as the seasons go by and you see how new coaching staffs are 
working on the field and what their on the field product will look like. That will certainly change the dynamics in some of these recruitments. So I think, I think anytime you have a new coaching staff, either you're committed to that new coaching staff or you're committed to another program and you're keeping an eye on a new coaching staff. So, and then plus coaching carousel, you know, you, you, you're going to have coaching carousel when it comes to December. So there's going to be movement again. Um, I still say keep an eye on Joel Starlings. He's right now, he's pretty solid to UNC, but I do feel like that's a recruitment that you just have to keep an eye on to see how this works. He hasn't visited anybody else apart from UNC since his commitment. But again, there's a long time between now and early signing day. So that's someone that I think um, should be watched on. Um, top guys on the board after Jacob Cruz commits one way or the other. Um, I, I think, you know, I mentioned who's trending. There's a few names on there. Uh, Deshaun Stone, the DB out of North Carolina is the one to watch. Anthony Calandrea, quarterback out of the Sunshine State. He visited UVA. Um, Tyler Coleman, an in-state playmaker that UVA is recruiting on both sides of the ball. They're recruiting him as an athlete, but they could see him at wide receiver and DB is another name to watch. What's next? Oh, what's the plan at QB for 2024 now that Reno is off the board? Um, Christian Martin is should be a name that everyone knows. He's Highland Springs quarterback. He camped at UVA, unofficially visited, earned his offer in the summer. And obviously Miles Green is doing his job recruiting him. He's a name to look out for in the 2024 class. I think Virginia will want to keep him home. Um, so that's a name to know. And they also offered FSU commit Luke Crumenhoek. Um, honestly, it's going to be hard to get him on grounds. And I think it's going to be hard to recruit him. Um, other schools are recruiting him as well. Uh, he's a really good quarterback. Uh, it's going to be hard. It's not impossible. Um, but I think Christian Martin will be the big name to know. And I think Luke Kromenik is open to visiting. And I think once you get on, get him on grounds, then we can talk about how realistic that is. But Christian Martin would be my, my big pick there. Most of these questions were asked about the realignment. Um, I don't have an update on any injuries on the basketball front. I know some of you have asked about that. I do not have anything right now. I asked I put in some feelers and I have not heard back since the taping of this podcast. So hopefully I'll have more on our message boards at Wahoo's 24 seven. So if I have any more updates, I will make sure to post it there, but I do not have those answers right now. Um, I hopefully I answered some of your questions. I will have some of those questions like the basketball injuries and any other questions on the Wahoo's 24 seven board. Like I said, we're going to also have Brian Doan on the show next week. So if you have any questions for Brian Doan, just leave it. On our message boards, I'll put a, a pin thread there so that I can ask some questions to Brian Dow. Of course, if you like what you're hearing, make sure you subscribe to us wherever you listen to your podcast and head over to Apple and Spotify and review and rate this podcast. It's a huge help and I would really appreciate it. And with that, we will be back here next Tuesday with more insight into Virginia sports. So for Cam Lemons, I'm Jackie Franchuli and hope you have a good rest of your week. Thank you.